Daniel chapter 11, verse 21. And the title of this message is The Man of Sin, part two. We did The Man of Sin, part one last week. And if you didn't hear that, all of our teachings are online. You can listen to them free. Just go to calvaryov.org or .com and just you can listen to them free if you ever miss one. And you can also download them MP3. It's all free for you. Uh, I, how many want to hear a joke? You want to hear a joke? See if I can do a joke here. But uh, since we're going to be talking about the Antichrist, the man of sin, I thought this joke might be appropriate. One bright, beautiful Sunday morning, everyone in a teeny town of Jonestown wakes up early and goes to their local church. Before the service starts, the townspeople sit in their pews, talk about their lives and their families, and suddenly, as they were doing that at the altar, Satan appeared, and everyone started screaming and running for the door, tramping each other to get out, uh, to, to get away from this evil incarnate. Soon everyone evacuated from the church except one man who sat calmly in the pew, seemingly obl oblivious to the fact that God's enemy was in his presence. This confused Satan a bit, so Satan walked up to the man and says, Hey, don't you know who I am? And the man says, Yep, sure do. And he says, Satan says, Well, aren't you afraid of me? The man says, Nope, sure ain't. <laughs> Satan was very perturbed. So he says, why aren't you afraid of me? The man says, well, I've been married to your sister for 25 years. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm just, that's, that's wrong. Anyway, that was kind of funny. Anyway. <laughs> Women love me, please. Okay, I know none of you are his sister, all right? Anyway, as we saw last week, the year was 175 B.C., and there were four generals that split up all that Alexander the Great had conquered. Remember, Alexander the Great had conquered the known world. And he wept because there was no more lands to conquer. And, and he, he then went and got drunk with his guys, walked out in the rain, and then fell asleep on his bed. And most people believe he got a fever and got pneumonia and died. Well, after he died, what happened is that, that he, his son didn't take over the kingdom what happened is that he split his kingdom up, or they split up. Four generals split his kingdom or his lands that he conquered up. And we looked last week especially at two of these generals and their families. The first family, if you remember, was the Seleucid or Antiochus family. They were in Syria, directly north of Israel. And then we looked at the Ptolemy family. It's, uh, it's got a P. Have you got that right there? The Ptolemy family but that you don't pronounce the P. So Ptolemy family, they were in Egypt directly south of Israel. So why were these two kingdoms of these four generals so important? It's because they surrounded Israel. And Israel, would, they would constantly fight each other. And because they fought each other, Israel was always in between. And one would take over Israel, the other one would take over Israel, they'd fight. So Israel was caught in the middle, and that's why this is so important to God telling Daniel this so that they would know what's going on. We're also going to see today that even though the families were bad, that, that an even more vile person is going to come out of one of these families, and that's the Seleucid or Antiochus family. What will emerge from that family, the Antiochus or Seleucid family, will be Antiochus Epiphanes. Remember that? You remember when we studied that? Antiochus Epiphanes was a picture of who? Does anyone know who he is? Antichrist, a picture of the Antichrist. We're going to see that. Antiochus Epiphanes. He's a very important person because prophetically he is a picture or foreshadow of the one who is even more vile than him, the Antichrist. So let's pray and pray that we can be not discouraged but encouraged to follow God. How many, how many know the Antichrist is coming again? He was already through, he was already pictured through Antiochus, Epiphanes, but now he's a picture of someone who's going to come even worse. We aren't going to see him, but how many know we're seeing the preparation for him to come? Amen. People say to me, Craig, why does our, 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 our government seem to almost want to destroy our country? And why is that? People say all these conspiracy theories, but hear this. Real simple. I like things simple, amen. Here it is. Satan, just like Jesus had John the Baptist, his forerunner, Satan or the Antichrist has a forerunner of men and women preparing the way for how do you know 
America has to go down so low that we are going to look for a one world leader also. How many know we're not there yet? And I, I want to try to keep that from happening as long as possible. Amen? But how many know it's going to come to that? And you see the liberal agenda wants to do that, wants to make us like every other country, wants to bring down the exceptionalism of America. And how many know that's not God? Amen? God says, do all your work heartily. We should be always improving. Amen? Yeah. We should never say, oh, let's just be like everyone, everyone else is a failure. Let's be a failure. No, we should be doing all our work for the glory of God. So let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for the sweet time of worship. I pray right now, Lord, I I don't pray, as I always say, a blessing on your word. Your word is blessed. But I ask, oh God, that you would anoint my tongue, that I would rightly and clearly articulate your truths, and those truths would set us free, that, Lord, I wouldn't add to your word, but I most definitely wouldn't shrink back, as Paul said, from giving the whole counsel of God. So many churches today are taking out things like sin and homosexuality and hell and, and, and holiness. They take out those things that are hard for us. But Lord, let us have the whole counsel of your word. Amen. Let us want to hear everything you have to say so that when we stand before you, we're not going to be shocked. We're going to know because we've heard what you require. So Lord, speak today. Let every heart be open to hear what you're saying. And I pray that right now you'd bind every demonic spirit that would try to distract, that would try to discourage, that would try to overwhelm. But Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would prevail and that we would, our eyes would be opened, our hearts would be yielded to you, and we would have the mind of Christ. Bless your people today. Speak to us today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Verse 21 of Daniel chapter 11. And in his place shall arise a vile person, talking about Antiochus Epiphanes, to whom they will not give the honor of royalty, but they shall come in peaceably and seize the kingdom by intrigue, or by flattery, I think other versions say. Verse 22, with the force of a flood, they shall be swept away from before him and be broken, and also the prince of the covenant. In 175 B.C., as I said, Antiochus Epiphany, the great public speaker, appeared on the scene. And isn't it amazing how Satan has these guys that speak so well? You know, he just, he comes on the scene and he flatters everyone, just speaks really well. And with great trickery and great flattery, he seduces the people in acknowledging that he was the rightful king, not only of Syria and the north, but also of Israel as well. And when he came to power, he overthrew the legitimate high priest. How many know there's an agenda in our country to do that? There's an agenda to to control what the church says and what the church doesn't say. And I want to tell you that's an antichrist spirit, amen, that says, hey, you can talk about God, but just talk about God this way. And how many know you see that in communism? You see that in China? It was just communist. You see the control. We'll we'll let you have your little Jesus, but we don't want to talk about salvation. We don't want to talk about anything that would change your life. And they control what is said. Well, that's what he did. He put in his own high priest, or he, he took out the legitimate priest, Onias III, and then put in his false priesthood and started kind of corrupting it and started getting like idolatry involved in that worship. Verse 23, And after the league is made with him, he shall act deceitfully, for he shall come up and become strong with a small number of people. I think God was trying to speak somewhere. With that. No, no. <laughs> Should I read that again? Verse 23, after the league is made with him, he shall act deceitfully, for he shall come up and become strong with a small number of people. Verse 24, he shall enter peaceably even into the richest places of the province, and he shall do what his fathers have not done, nor his forefathers. He shall disperse among them the plunder, spoil, and riches. See, he flatters. See, most of the time, kings would take all the spoil themselves. He's now distributing the spoils to his men, so they're loving him because, wow, he gives us a lot of the money, the loot. Um, He shall devise his plans against the strongholds, but only for a time. Edom, Moab, and Palestine, or Israel, were all part of his. He took over, not just Syria was his, but he took over all the lands, 
Antiochus took control of the richest, fattest parts of the real estate around Syria, including Israel. Verse 25, he shall stir up his own power and his courage against the king of the south with a great army. The king of the south shall be stirred up to battle with the very great and mighty army, but he shall not stand, for they shall devise plans against him. Yes, those who eat of the portion of his delicacies shall destroy him. His army shall be swept away, and many shall fall down slain. When Antiochus waged war against the Egyptians or the Ptolemy family, Antiochus renewed the old rivalry. But he did it, hear this again, with treachery, with trickery, and, and tricking some of the servants of the Ptolemy family to turn against their king. That's how conniving he was. You know, you've seen the Left Behind series? Do you remember when, when the, what, what, I don't remember, the Antichrist, but remember he shoots the guy in the U, United Nations and everyone just says nothing, they didn't see it, but then remember the one, the reporter, what's his name, goes, oh my goodness, did you see that? How many know there's going to be such trickery that people are just going to fall for it? He tricks the Ptolemy family in turning against their king. Thus the king of the south, or the Ptolemy family, was betrayed by his own people, by Antiochus Epiphany. So he's very treacherous or very tricky, and he deceives people. Verse 27, Both these kings' hearts shall be bent on evil. They shall speak lies at the same table, but it shall not prosper, uh, for the end will still be at the appointed time. Verse 28, While returning to his land with great riches, his heart shall be moved against the holy covenant, so he shall do damage and return to his own land. The Egyptians, or the Ptolemy family, right? Ptolemy family, you know that? They're from the, from, the, from, from the south. Knew that they had been had. Though they came to the peace table to set up peace agreements with Syria or Antiochus' family, they knew that they were both lying to their teeth. They're both deceiving us, each other. They're both trying to scam each other. How many of you know that's a lot of... Things with politicians today. How many know that? Just the trickery, the scamming. How many know you just, you just wish, can there be truth? I think that's why people like the outsider guy, right? I can't say who he is, but the outsider, the comb over, right? They like it because he maybe. Now, we know he does some trickery, amen? He didn't get to be Donald, whatever his name is, without some trickery. You don't work in New York and build buildings because my family, as you know, some of you know, was mafia. Everything that you build has to be done through the mafia in New York, or at least in the old days. I don't know about now. But so he knows how to play ball, but he's sort of saying, how many know? He says, I used to play ball with these people, and I want to stop playing ball. Now, hopefully he means that, but that's how much trickery it is. So they're both scammers, and they're both, he's just a little better than, uh, the, 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 than the Egyptians. Verse 29. <laughs> what? <laughs> What's so funny? I was funny and I didn't, what? <laughs> you never know. <laughs> no, <I'm kidding. laughs> Trickery. No, I'm just kidding. I was, when I don't even try to be funny, I'm funny. That's amazing. I can't, I got to just say something goofy all the time. I'll tell you. But anyway, verse 29. At the appointed time, he shall return and go towards the south, but it shall not be like the former or the latter. Verse 30, ships from Cyprus shall come against him. Therefore, he shall be aggrieved and return in rage. Hear that? In rage against the holy covenant and do damage. So he shall return and show regard for those who forsake the holy covenant. Years have passed, and Antiochus decides to make another military advance on Egypt. The ships of Cyprus were, were Roman ships or Roman warships. Now, hear this real quick. The Ptolemy family had made, because they're so treacherous, they had made a, a, a commitment or a covenant with, uh, with the Romans. And so they had this pact with the Romans, you protect us and we'll all be good. And so here Antiochus Epiphany is coming down and all of a sudden these Roman warships meet him and they say, hey, don't take one more step and hear this. You're going to love this. It's pretty cool. So he prevented Antiochus, the Romans prevented Antiochus from advancing. History tells us that Roman, one of the Roman soldiers or generals actually drew a line in the sand 
and said, step over that land, line, Antiochus, towards Egypt, and you're a dead man. That's where we get, draw a line in the sand. Isn't that amazing? Right there. It's amazing how many sayings come from the Bible. Amen? And, and you know, the Bible prophesied this before it happened. And here it is. He drew this line in the sand, said, you, t- you go past it, you're a dead man. And he knew that the Romans were just coming up in power, and he knew he was, uh, he was, a, he was a powerful army, but he knew not to mess with the Romans. And so he, he, he pulls back. But he's very angry. I thought that was very interesting. Do you remember anyone drawing a line in the sand to Assyria? A red line? Do you remember that? Who did that? Obama. The same people. Isn't that wild? If, you, if you're not sure history repeats itself, they, he, remember he says, the red line, you cross that with chemical weapons, you cross that, okay, well wait, if you cross this line, no, right, but uh, and it, how many know if you draw a line, you better back it up? Yeah. It doesn't look good when you say, here, I draw a line, and someone still, and you go, okay, well, that line, you know what I mean? You got to say, you know, if you're going to be a tough guy, you better be a tough guy all the way. So anyways... God bless our president. Anyway, verse 31. And the forces shall be mustered by him, and they shall defile the sanctuary fortress. They shall take away the daily sacrifice and place there, hear this, you've heard this before, the abomination of desolation. How many have heard that before? You've heard that, hopefully you've heard that if you studied prophecy. When Antiochus was prevented from going to Egypt by the Romans... He was very frustrated. So in great frustration and anger, Antiochus headed north, back home, right into Jerusalem. Because he's down by Egypt, now he's going through Jerusalem. And on the way there, he vented his angers, uh, anger upon the Jews. Upon his r- 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 arrival, he killed 40,000 Jews. If any of you live by Oro Valley, how many know Oro Valley is 40,000 people, 41,000? Can you imagine all of Oro Valley gone in one day? That's how angry, that's how treacherous, how mean this guy was. He just gets mad because he couldn't defeat Egypt. So then he goes to, on the way home, you know, they say, I forget what it's called, I don't know what uh, Freud called it, venting, that when you're frustrated, you'll go home and you'll what, kick the dog. How many know that's what this guy's doing? And Tigers Epiphanies, he can't beat up who he wants to, so then he beats up Israel, and that's why this is mentioned. He then, by the time his anger was fully vented, he killed 100,000 Jews, 100,000, slaughtered. Then he came the abomination of desolation. When he went into the Jewish temple, he killed a pig on the altar. How many know you're not supposed to have pigs, right? It's not just the Muslims that did that, right? The Jews too. You're not supposed to have pigs. And so he kills a pig to defile the altar, kills a pig, slaughters it right on the altar, and smeared the blood on the walls. And then he demanded the remainder to be drunk, drank by the, the Jewish priests. How many know that is desola- that's the abomination of desolation? That's a sick, sick dude who's definitely demon-possessed. Then he sets up a statue of, historians say, either Zeus or himself. We're not sure. So either himself or Zeus. And demanded that he or Zeus be worshipped. It was a sickening scene. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine seeing that? Could you imagine? It'd be like coming to our church and you see blood all over the walls and, and, and the cross torn off or put upside down and just, just you'd, be, you'd be crushed. And then because it was defiled, they couldn't worship in the temple anymore. So it was just totally abomination of desolation. It was terrible. That's why the Jews called him not Antiochus Epiphanes. You know the word epiphany? It means you have like, oh, the light goes off. It means the shining one. But they call them Epiphany or Antiochus Epinanes, which means Antiochus the madman. And they called him the madman because he truly was a madman. Indeed, indeed, along with Caesar Nero and Hitler, he is one of the most insane rulers in history. And if you know, you know, Caesar Nero, I don't know if he was into, I mean, I know he was demon possessed, but Hitler was definitely into Satanism. You know that he would just sit in the room in the dark and the what is it called? The lion's lair. What was it called? The lion's what is it? wolf's lair. Yeah, the wolf's lair. Wolf. There you go. Wolf's lair. So he just sit there and he was very much into Satanism. But I thought this was a neat. I want to show you this. We're going to see, and I'm getting ahead of myself, but we're going to see when Christians are truly on fire for God, when they truly know God, they're going to be strong even in the midst of times like this. I love the saying. I don't know if you've heard me say this before. But 
in the Fox Book of Martyrs, it talks about how Caesar Nero would take Christians and he would dip them in wax or dip them in tar and put them in these like little kind of cages up high in his garden and he'd light them on fire and he would ride naked through his, you know, he'd have a, chari- a, a charioteer ride him, drive him through his garden and he'd be naked and he'd be playing his violin, singing, mocking the Christians, you're the light of the world. But here's what would happen. This is now, it gets cool. You go, oh. you go, I'm scared. Here it is. The Christians would sing praises to God as they're burning alive. And it says it made him screech and he had to be driven out of there. How many love that? Yeah. Greater is Christ who is in you than he who is in the world. How many know that's a miracle of God, right? If you're burning alive with tar on you and you can sing praises to God, that's the glory of God. Amen. And hear this, guys. If you can sing praises to God with tar on you, how many of you should be able to sing praises here? Amen. Amen. Maybe we need to put some tar on you. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, get you excited. You know, get some tar. Maybe we should put a little tar on you, light you, get a little light on you, and you'll be on fire for God. No. Just want to make sure you're awake out there. Get you awake. I always say, just so you know, for your new people, I'm like the blind discus thrower. I don't set any records, but I hopefully keep your attention. You'll get that in the parking lot. Anyway, (laughs) verse 32, those who do wickedly against the covenant, he shall corrupt with flattery. Hear that. But the people who know their God shall be strong and carry out great exploits. This really makes me sad because I see the parallels of this time and our time. Listen to verse 32 again, the beginning. Those who do wickedly against the covenant, he shall corrupt with flattery. What's said is there's two camps of the Jewish people. There were those who said, this is terrible and this has to stop. And then say, we have to stand up. But there was another group that said, you know what? If you can't beat them, join them. There was another group that said, you know what? Let's just start worshiping Zeus. Let's start worshiping, you know, Antiochus. Let's start doing what, and that's, you know, we got to get along, to get, go along to get along. How many know the church is doing that in America a lot? Oh, Jesus is not, oh, it's bigoted to believe Jesus is the only way. Oh, well, Jesus is a way. Oh, homosexual is the law of the land. Oh, then homosexual is cool. We'll do homosexual marriage. Oh, you know, you name it. Just keep naming. Oh, uh, you, oh holy, you know, let whatever feels good do it. Well, we're not about sin. We're only about grace. How many know we can't let the world conform us into its image? We're supposed to conform the world to God's image. We're supposed to encourage them to live for God. How many know I love what uh, the J.B. Phillips translation talks about Romans 1. It says, don't let the world squeeze you into its mold. How many know that's what the world's trying to do to us? And if you watch TV, you see, right? You, You watch every movie. There's all a promotion of homosexuality. It's as if they ask the average college student, how many people are homosexual? And they say about 35%. How many know it's less than three, 2 to 3%? And yet the, there's such a push that the average college student, these are smart people, believe it's about 35%. How many know you're being told a lie? If you watch TV consistently, you're hearing a liberal agenda thrown at you. That's why I always say to you, you need to come on Sunday and hear an hour sermon to get your brain washed. And I don't mean brainwashed like, uh, I mean brainwashed like cleansed. Steam clean, you know, get the stuff out. You know what I mean? I I was talking to someone, you hear this? Somebody went, that was in our church, went to another church for like five years, four years, I don't know, three years. They'd never heard about homosexuality. They never heard that homosexuality was a sin. How many know we're to love the homosexual, but how many know a practicing homosexual cannot inherit the kingdom of God? The Bible says that, amen? 1 Corinthians 5. But nobody says that. So people, what? My people fall or fail for lack of knowledge. If you, as the people of God, don't know that, how is the world going to know that? And, and we need to speak the truth in love, amen? And how many of people say, oh, no, we just need to love them? How many know you can love someone all the way to hell? And they're going to say, if you love me so much, why didn't you tell me the truth about my lifestyle, about my life? about my choice. Uh, you, you made me think that there was many ways to God. How many know, you, you, they're going to say, why didn't you tell me that Jesus was the only way to God? We have to love people to say the hard things. And sometimes the world isn't going to love us. But how many know this, that I don't know about you, but there's two people here. I don't want to be someone that goes with the flow of this world 
and then has to stand embarrassed before Jesus. I'd rather go with Jesus and be a little bit pert down by this world, but feel good when I stand before God. Amen? That was a weak amen. Amen. Yes, Craig. Yes. Amen. Hallelujah. Woo. You know. But here it is. Listen to this one, the, end, the middle of the verse 32. But the people who know, that's yada, who know their God shall be strong and carry out great exploits. How many know this? The word gnoskos in the new, the word for know in the New Testament is not just to know about him, but it means intimacy like a man knows his wife, gnoskos. We are not to know God like we know President George Washington or we know Lincoln. We're to know God like we know our own spouse, our own family member. We're to know him intimately. Do you see why we ask you to worship? Do you see why we ask you to be in the Word? Because if you aren't in the Word and you don't know God, in these last days, guess what? You'll be the people who say, hey, got to go along to get along. And you'll be swept away by every wind of doctrine, swept away by the pressure of this world. But if you know your God, what, what does it say? If you know your God, you will be strong. How many need to be strong in these last days? you got to know your God to be strong. Right? I love Ephesians 6.10. Be strong in the Lord and the strength of his mighty power. I mean, you're not strong in yourself. But you, when you say, God, I'm weak, but you are strong, be strong in and through me. How many know you're strong? But you got to know your God. And care. And then it says, I love this, not just be strong, but then you'll carry out great exploits. How many know it's time for the church to start doing great exploits again in the world? Amen? Not just feed. I mean, you know what I mean? And I love that, you know, how many know? Most churches now, it's just a humanitarian gospel. How many know that's good to feed, right? We should care about the poor. But how many know we need to bring the gospel with the feeding? And we need to lay hands on the sick. We need to pray for those who are demonized. How many know there's some demonized people out there? I love what one pastor said. He goes, I used to look at a church back in the 50s and say, I wonder if anyone's demonized. I wonder if anyone has demonic oppression. And he says, now I look at the church and I wonder if there's anyone who is not demonized. Isn't that sad? Because why? There's so much sin in the church. And we, how many know God says he's coming back for a church without spot or wrinkle? Spot means stain from the world, wrinkle, stain within, sin within. How many know it's time to be holy? As it says in Peter, I believe, it says, no one shall see God unless he is holy. How many want to see God? Then we need to be holy. We need to be holy. The year now is 170 B.C. The Jews were devastated by the Holocaust, by 100,000 Jews being killed by Antiochus Epiphanes. Yet there was one family who decided to stand up to this madman. How many of you know, church, it's time again for us to stand up to a madman, and his name is what? Satan and his demons. It's time for us to pray, because guess what? The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God, the pulling down of strongholds, and how we do that is through prayer. And I want to tell you, voting is important, but that's not the answer in itself. Amen. I encourage you to vote. Every one of you should vote for the candidate that best represents your biblical values. Amen. No matter how weird, weird their hair is. Okay. No, just kidding. But I mean, I'm just teasing. But you need to vote. But how many know that is not the answer in itself? Amen. It's not the answer. And picketing is not the answer. Not that you can never picket. Or boycotting is not the answer in itself. But prayer is the answer. Prayer, prayer and speaking the truth in love and standing for things. So this family stands up. So they, they said, we, we need to pray and we need to take back our nation for God. Amen? Amen? Amen. We need to take it back because I tell you this, it, it's slipping away. And I, I tell you, you know, when we read prophecy, we realize that this world is going to slip away someday. That's why the Lord's going to have to rapture us. But how many know we should not sit back and just sing the song, Jesus, take the wheel, right? We shouldn't let go. We should be occupying and doing our best to restrain evil, right? That's what he says. What Paul says, expose evil. We should do our best to be used by God to restrain evil. But how many know one day it's going to get away from us? But how many know it shouldn't, because of our, it shouldn't be because of our apathy? We should be standing up. We should be speaking up, but we should be most of all prayed up and praying that the enemy would be bound. When you see someone at work who's just like, I, 
I am a new ager. I am filled with inner harmony and peace. You should be praying that that spirit of deception, that religious false spirit, would be bound in Jesus' name. You should be praying that the Holy Spirit would be loose and the Holy Spirit would touch them and convict them and show them the truth. And we need to do that. Remember what Jesus said, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth, we have authority. I was just telling the leadership that, that Luke 10, 18, and 19 says this. He's, Jesus says, you know, he says, all authority has been given to me. How do you know that? He, he won on the cross. He won the war. But he says, now I've given you authority to trample upon snakes and scorpions and all power over the enemy, and nothing shall injure you. How many can humbly say, we do not live that verse? We're supposed to be trampling upon snakes and scorpions, trampling upon the devil, not the devil trampling upon us. Don't we, oh, I mean, we say, we'll say, oh, greater is Christ who is in us, but then we, the devil shows up, we all go, ha, ah, and run out. How many we should say, in the name of Jesus, be gone, and he should leave. Amen? We should be bold as lions. The righteous are as bold. We should be the ones who are taking authority, not the devil. How many know the gates of hell, Jesus said, will not prevail against his church? But how many know they're trying to? They're trying to squish us in, squish us in, squish us in, put us in the closet. But how many know if we'll walk in the fullness of God, if we'll get back to prayer, how many know we, Christ in us, can push back the darkness? Amen? What do, you, what, what do you do when you go, when you turn on the cl- uh, light in your closet? Do you see a war with light and darkness going, Aah! no. As soon as you turn on the light, darkness flees. How many know you're the light of the world, Jesus said? Let your light so shine that good men may see your good deeds. And how many know, some people that don't want the light, they'll run from you because what, what happened, what did demons do when they saw Jesus? They go, hey, what's up, homie? They went, ah, why did you come to torment us before the time? How many like to be like that? You know what I mean? I don't want to be like the sons of Sceva. Remember what the demon said to them? We know Jesus and we know Paul, but who are you? And then it was naked time after that. Remember, they stripped him naked. I don't want that to happen in deliverance. Amen? You don't want to see me naked. It's not good. Right? So we need to be right with God. Right with God and prayed up. All right? Well, a man stood up. His name was Judah. His brothers were known as the Maccabees. Maybe you've heard of that. They launched a guerrilla warfare against Antiochus Epiphanes and lasted about from to about 165 BC, about five years. When they over so hear that, it takes time sometimes to get the enemy out of your out of your country, out of your land, out of your home. They over then they 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 overthrew the Syrians or Antiochus Epiphanes, threw them out of Jerusalem. And hear this, guys. No matter how big the enemy might be. Or how dark the day may seem, like our day. Or how large the battle may loom. Verse 32 again. The people who truly know their God will be strong and do great exploits. Amen? They'll do it. They won't maybe be strong. They will be strong. And they'll do great exploits if they know their God. That's the contingency. That's the, that's the qualifier. Know God. Because they realize why? They realize Romans 8.31 if God be for us, who can be against us? They realize, John, is it 4, 4, 1 John 4, 4, that, that greater is Christ who is in us than he is in the world. They believe that. But here I know this, guys. If you're not living right, those verses are just nice verses to you. If you're not living right, and if you're not spending time with God daily, if you're not praying to God, guess what? That's a nice verse, but you, you don't feel the power. How many know? Hear this. The righteous are as bold as lion. You know what that means? Those who are right with God. Now, that doesn't mean you're perfect, but it means you're living in a way to where you want your life to be right with God. How many want to do that? To where we're saying, God, I, if there's anything in me, I want to be, I pray for all of you and myself that we have a heart like David in Psalms 139, verse 23 and 24, where he says, Search me, O God, know my heart. See if there be any anxious thoughts within me. Anything I'm worried about, right? You, you guys are never anxious, right? You're always excited about our election, excited about our economy, right? right? Any anxious thought, to confess that. Say, God, that's sin. I'm worried. The Bible says, be anxious for nothing. So you confess that as sin. I trust you that you are Jehovah Jireh. You will provide for me, even in these hard times. Amen? So you confess any anxiety, any worry, any worry about health, Right? Worry, right? I get taxed. Oh, my wife. What if the cancer comes back? Oh, right? No. I am commanded by God. Fear not. How many know it says fear not 365 times in the Bible? One for every day. 
It's like God wants you to fear not. And if he says fear not, how many know you can fear not? You go, no, God. Yes, you can, right? That'd be mean if he said fear not and you can't fear not. You have a choice, right? I forget where I was going there. It was something I got so excited. I don't remember what I was saying there. What was I just saying there? Well, never mind. I guess it wasn't good. But anyways, <clears throat> we need to know that God is for us. Oh, living right. Because if we're not living right, then I said that we will not have the power we need to have. Because then when you pray for someone or you rebuke the devil, the devil's going to laugh at you and go, seriously? Are you serious? And we need to do right. I love one verse I've always lived by that's changed my life is hear this. It says, he who conceals his sin will not prosper. How many know there's a lot of people in the church concealing sin? But I mean, everything's laid bare before the Lord. You're not hiding it from God. You might be hiding it from me or from other people around you, but you're not hiding it from God. It says, he who conceals his sin will not prosper, but he who confesses and renounces his sin will find mercy. And that's why he says, see if there be any anxious thought. And then he says, try me and, and see if there be any wicked way within me. And how many know a lot of us have wicked ways, right? You just drive down the road. It's easy to be wicked, right? <laughs> You know, I love when someone cuts you off and you go, hey. I mean, I don't do anything with my hand. I just go, hey. And then they go, hmm. And you're, oh. And then I, oh. Then I'm tempted to be wicked, right? But you know what I'm talking about. And, but you know, we need to confess that. We need to say, God, I'm sorry for that. I'm sorry that, you know, that guy thought it was his road and not mine. You know, but no, okay. But <laughs> that's a joke. But um, I want to tell you this. The gutsiest and bravest people in the world are true believers. And what's the key? Those who know their God. The, these true believers, they don't back down, they don't give up in the face of challenges. I want to tell you this. As we saw a couple chapters ago, remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? How many of those were pretty bold boys? The young kids, and they said, hey, you know, we're not going to bow to your little image, your gold thing, it was 100 feet or wherever it was, 80, I don't know what it was, but high. And he said, we're not going to bow. And they said, well, you know, there's a furnace if you don't bow. And he says, don't care, not going to bow. He says, and our God can deliver you, deliver us from you, but even if he doesn't, we are not going to bow. How many know the Bible says in, in Revelation 12, it says they overcame him, Satan, by the what? Blood of the Lamb. And we like that and we just leave it there. Okay, let's go. He says, by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, and here's the part we don't like, and they did not love their life so much as to what? Shrink from death. Remember that word death there is martis. And we think martyr means what? You die for Jesus. That's not what it means. Martis means you're a faithful witness even unto death, if that's what it means, if that's what needs to be. It doesn't mean a martis is somebody who just says, here, kill me. A martis says, I'm going to be a faithful witness even if it requires my life. See the difference? And how many know we all need to be martyrs right now? All of us need to have that martyr spirit to say, I, to live is Christ, to die is gain, and I'm not going to deny Jesus to live. Amen? Amen? Because if you do that, you're going to be really sad when you stand before God because you ain't going to experience a whole lot of life. Because what did Jesus say? If you deny me before men, I deny before my Father. And he comes in glory with all his heavenly angels. So I'd rather be denied, I'd rather be beat up by men on this earth and be right with God than be right with man and then stand before God and go, oh, 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 right? And just be at peace. Because if God be for you, who can be against you? But if God's against you, whoa, right? Who can you compete? You can't get Judge Wapner. I mean, there's nothing. You are done, right? And so you get my point there? So let's be bold. Let's remember that verse. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony. So testify what Jesus has done. Always give a hope, or always be ready to give a hope for what God has done in your life. And then what? Don't love your life so much as to wimp out, right? And that means sometimes speaking up at work. And that means sometimes that it might actually cost us our jobs. Think about this. If people died for Christ, I think probably in our day, you're not going to probably die yet, but sometimes we might be demoted or might have some problems with our job. Amen? And I tell you, only you and God can work that out, but you need to say, God, what do you want me to do? And not go this. this is, I love what people say. Well, God wouldn't want me to suffer. Oh, yeah, right? That's why all the disciples died, right? Except John, right? 
How many know sometimes God does allow suffering with his saints? And we have to say, you know, I, I think about it. I think about a person who wants to get in the White House, and that person has said they want to tax the church. They want to take away the 5013C. That means you don't get a tax rate. How many know that will change the church dramatically? Now, to make the church really do what's right because people will give for God. But how many know it'll affect the church? And that's what's coming to a town near you if the liberal agenda keeps going. And so I encourage you to pray. I encourage you to vote and to ask God who he would have you vote for. Because guess what? Uh, you know, they said, I guess in all of our history, we've never had two candidates that are so unpopular. If that doesn't show you where our country is, I don't know what does. Because, you know, I mean, there isn't a lot of, you know, there's a lot of trouble out there. And we, we, uh, we need help. We need God to change it. But no matter how dark they might be, we need to say, I'm going to continue to do what he's called me to do. Amen. We're going to do what God's called us to do. And guys, that's why we study the word. That's why that we might know God and do great exploits in his name. And hear this. I was talking with a young man this week, and he was big into knowledge. And I was look, looking at him, talking to him, and I realized how many know a lot of us, we study the word to know the word. We want to just know the word and be able to win at Bible trivia. But how many know the real reason we should study the Word is to what? Know the God of the Word. We should want to know Him, gnoskos, intimately. How many know there's a big difference between knowing about God and knowing God's heart, knowing how He thinks, knowing how He speaks? Remember what Jesus said? This is for those of you who are old Baptists like I was. How many know Jesus says, My sheep hear my voice and will not listen to the voice of another? How many know you're supposed to hear the voice of God? Not just through his word either. You're supposed to be able to pray and hear the voice of God. Maybe not Moses, not like that. But how many know you should be able to hear an inner witness of what God, you should be able to pray to God and say, God, what would you have me do? And God could speak to you, amen? God could give you peace or he could, there's many ways he speaks, but you should be able to hear from God if you know him, amen? My sheep know my voice, will not listen to voices. How many know there's a lot of voices out there, so you better know his voice? There's a lot of voices saying, I'm Jesus. You know, no, you better know. You know, how many know? I, I always could tell kind of the difference between my voice and Jesus' voice and the devil's voice. How many know the devil's voice is very loud? You ever notice that? Yes, should I do that? No, don't do that. Oh, okay, that's the devil, right? Because he's loud. But the Spirit's voice is usually that still, small voice that's very, it's very powerful, but very, it's like a deep river. It doesn't yell, it just says, hey. Don't do that. You know what I mean? Has anyone seen? Does anyone? People are like, you're weird. Right? No. <laughs> That's it. But we need to know not just the word of God, but the God of the word. That's my prayer. I want to give you a chance right now. Can you shut off the lights, someone? And bow your heads. I haven't done this for a while, but I want to give you a chance. You know, sometimes, you know, I think Adil Moody said he never, he gave one time a sermon where he said he gave a chance for people to respond to Christ. Well, he said, he goes, think about receiving Jesus. And, and he said, I'll, 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 I'll give an altar call next week. Well, the next, that week was the Chicago fire. And many thousands of people died. And he vowed after that he would always give an altar call. And so I don't do that but because a lot of you guys are saved. But I want to give you a chance. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus, I want to give you an opportunity to get to know him, to really Ask him into your heart to really yield your heart, to, to surrender all of your life to him. And how many know that's, that's the key? When I got saved, the, the, the way my life, I was a drug addict, drug dealer, fighter, womanizer, and immediately was changed overnight pretty much. And it was because I came to Jesus. And here's what I prayed. This is my simple prayer. I'd almost killed myself the night before. I said, Jesus, if you can do, Jesus, I hate my life. But if you can do something with my life, it's yours. I give it to you fully. There was no bartering. There was no deals. I just said, Jesus, I surrender. I'm tired of running my life. You take it. And how many know if you're here today and you've never really handed over the reins of your life to Jesus, then I want to give you the opportunity to do it for the first time. Or maybe you're here today and you know Jesus, but like the prodigal son, you've kind of gotten entangled in the things of the world. And God today in love is calling you back. He's saying, come back, son. Come back, daughter. Know me again. Walk with me. 
And if you'll do that, if you'll come back, he'll put that robe on you of righteousness. He'll put the ring of sonship and he'll, he'll receive you back. Amen. So if that's you today and you feel the Holy Spirit drawing you right now, if you feel the Holy Spirit just saying, today's your day, with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you feel today that God is calling you to give your life to Him or recommit your life to Him, with every bow, eye closed and every head bowed, just between you and God, if you prayed that, if you, if you want to receive Jesus and recommit your life to Him, just raise your hands right now. Just raise your hand. Don't be afraid. Anyone? God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Anyone else? Don't be afraid. God bless you. With every head bowed and every eye closed. Now I'm going to pray for you. Anyone else, you want to recommit your life or give your life to Christ for the first time? If you didn't raise your hand, raise it high again so I can see. Amen. Amen. And some of you may, might not want to raise your hands, but you feel the Spirit of God is drawing you to recommit your life. I want to pray for you now. Lord Jesus, I thank you for every hand that's raised, every hand that was raised up, and I ask that, Lord God, you, whether they are coming to you for the first time or they're recommitting their life, I pray that they would pray this in their heart with me. Lord Jesus, I confess to you I'm a sinner. Please forgive me of my sins and fill me with your Holy Spirit. Thank you for dying in my place and cleansing me from all unrighteousness. Thank you for receiving me for the first time or thank you for receiving me back. But Lord Jesus, as the scripture showed us today, I don't just want to know about you. I want to know you. That I might be strong in these last days. That I might do great exploits. That you through me would do great exploits. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for receiving me back. And now I humbly ask God in Jesus' name that you would empower me to live for you all the days of my life. I pray also, Lord, that you would give all of us the strength to stand in these last days. Amen. That we would be able to fulfill that verse in Revelation 12 of they overcame him, Satan, by the blood of the Lamb, Jesus. And by the word of their testament, they were bold to speak the truth in love. Seasoned with love, the truth in love. They testified of what you've done for them and what you can do with them if they'll yield their life to you. And then they did not love their life so much as to shrink from death. Give us boldness like the Maccabee family. Give us boldness to where they stood and they were bold, to where they fought for your will to be done. Show us, Lord, that today... Our fight is not so much physical, but our fight is spiritual. And thank you, Lord, that you've given us the weapons in your name and the power of your Holy Spirit and the power of your blood. You've given us the authority to trample upon snakes and scorpions and all power of the enemy. Let us take our authority in Christ. Amen. Let us walk in the fullness of you, that we might not just be a little church hanging on, but we're a people who push back the darkness in our workplaces, in our families, at our gym, at Quick Trip, wherever we go, we are letting your light shine brightly, which will dispel the darkness. Thank you, Lord. We ask all these things in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. If you prayed that prayer to receive Christ, or you prayed that prayer to recommit your life, make sure you tell somebody. Make sure you say, hey, I recommitted my life today. Will you hold me accountable? Will you encourage me? Because I really, how many know you need that? We need that, be encouraged that way. So let's do that. Let's stand right now and worship the Lord with all of our heart. Bless you.